Oscar Mari, director of the ATI, and uh, Nami Kambo, deputy director of the ATI, and all the young officers of the APSC who I can uh, identify a few of you. Firstly, uh, it's a great uh, you know, pleasure being here. And of course, an honor to be amongst all of you. When I say honor, it's because you are the present and the future of Arunachal. And uh, seeing the smiling, bright faces, I, I, I can actually feel the, uh, uh, you know, that energy which is so palpable. And uh, despite the crawling uh, traffic that I went through, I myself am feeling energized by being with you. So thank you. Uh, I will take about uh, half an hour to share with you my experiences. Not all, but a few relevant experiences that I have had uh, in the course of my service in the army. Uh, I do understand that uh, you know, listening to a lecture is never a very, very comfortable feeling. So, your director had given me the option of, you know, taking more time to share my experiences, but then I was telling him that lecture is something, you know, which most of us, unless we are listening to someone who is very, very interesting orator, someone like, you know, uh, maybe uh, Barack Obama, when they speak, you want to listen. I am a soldier, now an ex-soldier, a man, who was in uniform, so I'm not very good at giving lectures, okay? I'm very good at giving orders. <laughs> Nonetheless, uh, like I said, it's a pleasure being here. And uh, I've made some notes basically to ensure that I do not digress or go off on a tangent, all right? So, I'd like to thank the director for giving me this opportunity today. So by default I'm here, but I'm very happy that I'm here. Because uh, this is my first time after coming back, after uh, shedding my uniform, after handing my boots, this is the first time that I'm getting this opportunity to interact with a set of young dynamic officers. That people, some of you uh, would have uh, gone through the interview through me. How many of you? Can you raise your hand? There you are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So, happy seeing all of you. And uh, I can tell you one thing. Having gone through uh, so many interviews in the last year and a half, I'm very happy to tell you that the quality of candidates are improving by the day. That is probably because the competition is increasing. The number of applicants are increasing. And people have also realized that the only way to success is hard work and nothing else. And that has, I think, set this trend where people have started I think, going through the coaching institutes and uh, started having your own group of you know, students getting together to study and understand the subjects. So it's a pleasure you know, when you come across candidates who exude so much of confidence, who have so much of knowledge. There are times I've actually foxed because I think I don't know what to do. That is the kind of, uh, uh, I'll say, preparation that you have done. So, I am once again very honored to be here and giving you this talk. 
Now, I believe uh, you have about a month's training. And when you talk of training, let me tell you, I mean, man in uniform, training was synonymous, is synonymous to the army. It is our bread and butter. And why so? A lot of people ask me, ki, aap log karte kya? Jab ladai nahi ho raha aap karte kya? I'm sure some of you also feel the same. Ki, aap log aise ho, kya karte ho? Kashmir mein. <laughs> you go sightseeing or something. Let me tell you that, uh, just for now, what happens is, we are constantly training, training for a war which may or may not take place. But the point is, you cannot wait for a war to start, to start your training. Then, that's a short shot recipe for a defeat. So you prepare for a war. And let me tell you, uh, you know, having gone through lots of these uh, counterinsurgency operations, preparation and training can make a world of a difference. I'll just cite you an example. I was a general officer commanding in the valley when this surgical strike happened. You all heard about the surgical strike? Right? where our troops went across the line of control and struck at four places simultaneously at the same time, early in the morning, and killed more than about 200 militants in their camps. The court put their pants down. And there's a movie on this which has been made. The movie, Uri, The Surgical Strike. If you haven't seen it, it's worth a watch. So during that period, when I was there in the valley, I commanded a force called Kilo Force. Kilo Force is, uh, I will say, the most important formation of the country because it is in the hottest insurgency bed of the valley, North Kashmir, where these militants infiltrate and they have the first encounters with the troops of Kilo Force. That is after crossing the LC. There are troops deployed on the LC. But the actual battle with the militants start after they are actually infiltrated into the valley. And that is North Kashmir. So Kilo Force basically looks after North Kashmir. Now what happens is, when I took up a command, <clears throat> I learned, I went through the statistics, for every militant kill, Rather, for every three to five militants killed, we're losing one soldier, which is a big loss. Success of an operation is when you eliminate the enemy and do not suffer your own casualty. I would put it that way. So, when I started uh, analyzing, I realized that you know there was a need to go back to, to go back to the basics. People have, uh, you know, all these soldiers are well trained. They are experienced soldiers. But over the years, what happens is you start growing in confidence. And that confidence grows into overconfidence. And then that is when you become Rambo. You think you are bulletproof. You know, you start taking risk. So, I organized uh, a session, a brainstorming session with all the officers of my formation, the Kilo Force, two days, where I tried to highlight the fact that they have to go back to the basics and how to go about conducting your operations. Why you should not hurry, why you should not rush into uh, this thing, gaining of information, intelligence, all this thing. In short, just to sum it up, by the end of my tenure, that is one and a half years of my command as a GOC, <clears throat> we had 52 kills, all foreign militants, and not a single casualty of our own. That I thought was my biggest success as a GOC, 
because I did not lose a single soldier of ours. And this is at a place which is considered the hottest bed of militancy in the country. So this is the effect of training and preparation. So that is why I talked about training. Okay. Now, while you are here for the next one month, the director was mentioning that they are short of staff. So there are two men army. <laughs> and uh, you are going to be there, you know, those commandos <laughs> who are going to undergo the training. I know you have a different kind of training. It's all about, you know, administration. And, and let me also share with you, I have also done a post-graduation uh, diploma in public administration from IIPA, Indian Institute of Public Administration, for a year. All right. That was as a brigadier. And uh, I realized that, you know, uh, the content of the course was very, very impressive. The whole, uh, you know, I'll say the subject galore, I mean, a different kind. And one thoroughly enjoyed going through the course. And I also had the distinction of getting a distinction. Okay, on that course, and I felt very proud about it. That's why I'm sharing it, huh? because it was not my subject. I could, I could talk about, you know, soldiering, I could talk about military leadership, but public administration was something absolutely new to me, so it was a good exposure for me. Now, so learn, enjoy your training. If, to, if you don't enjoy, try and enjoy it. Okay? Learn well and carry the lessons forward, because this is what is going to help you in the future. And uh, <clears throat> again, all of you are joining the services. You are also doing your on-the-job training, which probably is not visible, but you are doing it. And this will continue because learning is a continuous process, right? You keep learning. You keep learning even as a grandfather. So this learning, this on-the-job training, this training that you are undergoing today, this will ensure that you grow as a professional. That you learn from the other's experiences, other's mistakes. Because when people come and talk to you, they will give you their own experiences, like I am doing today. Alright. Now, <clears throat> In service, what will happen is that you go in service, you will start becoming an important cog in the wheel of the government machinery. Now, which means you grow in power and authority. Don't let this power and authority go to your head. It's a caution. Because by and large, this happens with most of us. The moment you wield the power of authority, you start becoming a little heady, you know. So guard against this. Remain humble. Remain grounded. Remain positive. Be helpful, be kind. Let me tell you. Prayers and blessings do make a lot of difference in your lives. Let that happen with you also. Don't be unkind to people because they say that the ka jo hai na, wo jor se lagta hai. So when you grow in power and authority, don't forget this. Most of us do this mistake. The moment you sit on a system of power, seat of power, you tend to become a little dictatorial, little, uh, the common word is proudly. No? Don't do that. Now, the biggest challenge that you as an administrator or as a boss in your environment 
is going to be the management of human resources. As a deputy commissioner in a district, you have hundreds and thousands of staff working under you. In today's environment, it's an IT world, a lot of transparency, visibility, people are aware of their rights, their privileges. Unfortunately, when it comes to the duties, they are not as forthcoming. So, there is a new balance. But that is where you as a leader has to handle. <coughs> the system, because of this, uh, you know, visibility, this transparency, the RTI and all this, there is a lot of inertia even within your offices. Inertia means things don't move, files don't move. And this is your challenge. You, as a young officer, must start now to make a little difference. It is difficult to change the system. No, I am not asking you to change the system. Because if you try that, you will be called a rebel. And that will be professional hierarchy, you know. So don't do that. But within your domain, you try and bring in small changes in your work culture. That will make a difference. The difference may be very subtle, but over the years, it will grow bigger. So the little that you contribute will make a big difference in the future. So don't think that I can do what I can do, I can do what I can do. No, what you are doing alone, that is not visible, but that will make a difference. So each one of you, if you start making a little difference in your setup, your domain, that is the beginning of a revolution which is not visible. And that is something I urge each one of you to feel that you can make a difference. You can be the beginning of that change. All right. <clears throat> and uh, what happens is, when you try to make changes in a system which has been there for a long time, there will be a lot of resistance. I'm in the commission. Last one and a half years. We're not trying to make changes there. For the good. But then you also realize that when you are interacting with the other departments, the responses are not forthcoming. Then you get a little you know, uh, impatient. But then you hold your horses because you don't want to be aggressive in your approach. So you try and, uh, you know, to the same secretariat or to the governor or to something, you try and get the things moving. And it is moving and moving in the right direction. And I can feel the changes which is happening. We are putting down the guidelines, the SOPs in place, so that the tomorrow of our younger generation is kind of ensured. So that is something you guys also can do. However, you have to have the right approach. Like I said, you can't be a rebel, but make a beginning somewhere. For example, coming to office on time itself is a beginning. I'll share with you, uh, before that, <clears throat> when I was doing my master's in management science, I've done that also. I've also done MPhil in social science. So don't think that I'm only a 4G. I have studied a little bit. No, when I was doing this Masters in Management Studies, I came across this Maslow's theory on the hierarchy need. You know, the human... Uh, Maslow was a psychologist, an American psychologist in the 20th century, who had uh, given this hierarchy of needs theory Basically saying that the human being has five stages of growth. 
Firstly is the physiological need. Understandable, physiological needs, khana, pani, that. That is what you need, the basic need of a human being, okay? <clears throat> then comes the safety needs, which means you need a job, job security, you know? Safety and security. Then comes your need for love. Love and belonging. So you want to have a wife, you want to have a family, you want to have friends. Then comes your self-esteem, which is very important. Now you want recognition. You want respect from people. And the final stage is self-actualization, which is to achieve the nirvana. <laughs> no, self-actualization means attaining your full potential as an individual. Prime Minister Modi has, I think, achieved uh, self-actualization. I really think so. A man who began from air has reached where he can only dream of. So, why not all of us probably will self-actualize, but if you can keep your targets achievable, you will achieve self-actualization at your own level. Today, each one of you probably are at a stage of the third stage of seeking self-esteem. And that is what I'm talking about. How you should grow in your service. To maintain your self-pride and self-esteem. To be able to look up, put your head held high, look into the eyes of the people and respond without having to look down. That is self-esteem. So, all of you guys today, I think, are at a stage of uh, love and belonging and a little bit of self-esteem. Self-actualization will come a little later. So, if you can understand this and deal with the people under your command by understanding the basic needs of a human being, you will be a success as a boss, as a leader. Now what will happen is, you may not get the same listing from your boss. Don't worry about it. You must learn from his mistakes. But don't try to teach your boss how to work. That will be professional harakiri again. Learn from his mistakes. Keep a note of it. If you don't trust your memory, note it down in a day. Note on the good things, so that tomorrow when you grow, your domain grows, you can at least impact your domain, you can influence your domain in a positive manner. And each one of you making an impact in your domain, imagine what the impact is going to be, the overall. That is something we all need to understand. Now, <clears throat> so talking about, I tell you, that human resource management, we have a challenge of a different kind. Here, in the uniform, we have to motivate our soldiers to actually die for a cause which we are not aware of other causes. We have to motivate them to face bullets, which I think is the biggest challenge that a leader can have. How can you ask somebody to die to up? You know, the Kargil war, where, <clears throat> where such high casualties of officers, young officers, why? Because they led from the front. And they led from the front, why? Because of self-esteem, self-pride. No one wants to die, mind you. But when you're commanding troops, you have a self-pride. Cowardice dikhaunga, to tomorrow how do I face my troops? So it is that self-pride that drives you. This Bharat Mata issue does not come there. Be practical. Bharat Mata issue doesn't come there. There it is you and your team. 
That is why you have the war cries like Ayo or you know, things like that. Satsri Akar. All these war cries are what? This is to psych yourself into doing things which you actually don't want to do or which you are afraid to do. And this leadership is not confined only to a war. It is also in your day-to-day -day management. I had the uh, opportunity to serve in the Ministry of Defence, Ministry of Defence in Delhi, that is a department called uh, Land and Works, Land and Works of the Army. So basically it dealt with, rather it deals with all the land holdings of the army in the entire country and thereafter all the projects, works which come up on these holdings. Uh, annual outlay of about 5,000 crores, approximately. So when I got posted there, this department, for some unknown reasons, had a very low priority in the scheme of things. Because of which, the entire organization had gone into a state of inertia. And a posting to this department was considered a last leg posting. Iske baad jairan karna hai, jairan karna hai because you have to shed your uniform thereafter. Now, then Modi happened in 2014. A lot of changes happened for the good. The land in the army became a priority subject. And that was the time, then the army chief, General Vikram Singh, that Khalsa, I hope you remember. He handpicked me to head this team because I had served with him in Kolkata when he was the army commander. And he picked me up to be with him in Kolkata basically because I was, uh, you know, commanding a brigade in Rupa as a brigadier. For some reason he thought I would do a good job, so he called me there and thereafter he called me to Delhi to head this London works. Basically with the mandate to shake up the system and deliver. This organization is manned by defense civilian employees. About 100 in numbers. It, had, it has six directors, of which five are forgy officers, army officers, full colonels, and one civilian. The rest was all civilian defense employees. Now, <clears throat> after I joined, I observed this working for about a month. Then I called for a meeting. Like I called the entire, this hundred odd employees for a meeting. And I spoke to them at length. And I spoke to them about my observation in the past one month. Few things that I brought out. Firstly, I said, you know, you people have brought in the Delhi culture into the offices. What is Delhi culture? They are rude, crude. Sorry if somebody is, uh, you know, nothing against any individual. But Delhi is like that. Neighbors don't talk to the neighbors. You don't talk to each other. You don't know who is there. You just exist. You just do your work. If not, probably you'll have a fight with your neighbors. But friends, very seldom. Probably. That is how, you know, uh, the competition makes you <coughs> transform you into. So I said, don't bring the Delhi culture here in the office. We must begin to acknowledge each other's presence. Because what used to happen was I would come in the morning, walking through the corridor, they would actually see through me, my employees, and the boss. Lift, they would be standing next to me, but they would avoid my eye, you know, eye contact. So I didn't like this. So I told them. Firstly, I said, I'm your boss. I said, right? They said, yes, sir. So I 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 said, yes, sir. If you say that, then you are telling a lie because I am the only chief here. 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 I am 
अगर मेरे को नहीं पहचाना था तो समथिंग यू नीड टू हैव योर आई चेक आई साइड चेक कर ठीक है तो दे ऑल हैड अ हार्टी लाफ व्हेन आई सेड दिस आई सेड यस दिस इज द काइंड ऑफ लाफ एंड स्माइल आई वांट टू सी इन यू व्हेन यू सी मी अगर जय हिंद बोलने में शर्म आ रहा है तो स्माइल मार दो आई सेड यू गिव मी अ स्माइल आई गिव यू अ 400 वोल्ट स्माइल आई कैन गिव यू अ बिगर स्माइल बट इफ यू इग्नोर मी मैंने कहा मेरा तेरा थोकाई वही करूंगा सबके सामने आप बेइज्जत हो जाओ सो रिमेंबर दिस so learn to acknowledge each other's presence i said that was number one so basically to make them all realize that we are part of a team where we all belong to each other number two i said punctuality now what used to happen was most of the employees would come at around 10 o'clock where the office started 9 o'clock so when i asked them ki bhai late kyu hua sir hamara metro late hai इस तो कमाई में तो ओके मेट्रो लेट है उससे पहले तो मेट्रो नहीं है क्या ये सब और थोड़ा सुबह जल्दी हो जाता है ना फिर देरी तो कम लेट नॉट अर्ली सो दैट्स ओके आई सेड ओके ठीक है सुबह घर में काम होता होगा कोई बात नहीं लेकिन शाम को बाय फोर ओ क्लॉक वाइंडिंग अप क्या हुआ तो मेट्रो पकड़ना है अरे ऑफिस टाइम तो साढ़े पाँच बजे तक है सर हमारा पाँच बजे छूट जाएगा सर मैंने कहा छः बजे तो मेट्रो होगा ना हाँ सर तो अभी लेट क्यों नहीं जाना चाहते अभी जल्दी है ना सुबह तुमको जल्दी नहीं आना है शाम को जल्दी जाना है ऐसे यू कैन हैव द के के नीचे टू ये मंजूर नहीं है यू मेक अ चॉइस इफ यू कम लेट इन द मॉर्निंग यू गो इन टाइम इन द इवनिंग और यू कम अर्ली इन द मॉर्निंग देन यू गो अर्ली इन द इवनिंग सो आई सेड यू ओनली हैव दिस चॉइस आई गिव इट टू यू आई गिव इट टू यू टू मेक अ चॉइस थर्डली आई सेड टी ब्रेक्स एंड लंच ब्रेक एक तो आप दस बजे आते हो साढ़े दस बजे टीम ब्रेक है सो दस बजे आके आप एक उतारते हो एक फाइट आसे उठा के यहाँ रख देते हो फिर उसको ढांकते हो फिर मुंह में थोड़ा सा वो डाल दिया कहीं भी डाल दिया फिर बोलते हो अरे चाय का टाइम हो गया छत के ऊपर रेस्टोरेंट है वहाँ जाते हो धूप से के विंटर में ठीक है चाय टाइम इज फ्रॉम टेन थर्टी टू टेन फोर्टी टेन टेन फिफ्टी बीस मिनट का यू कम बैक एट इलेवन ट्वेंटी तो गप लगा के आए धूप से के मजे से ठीक है देन यू कम देन यू सी क्या करना है तो फाइव को यहाँ से उठा के फिर वापस यहाँ रख दिया है एक बार उठा के दूसरे टेबल पर रख दिया इस बार थोड़ा ज़्यादा काम कर गया तो ऐसे देन बाई डूइंग दिस इस ट्वेल्व थर्टी इलेवन थर्टी टू एक घंटे में तू इतना कर लेता है देन यू से भी ट्वेल्व थर्टी खाने का लंच का टाइम हो गया एक बजे का लंच का टाइम है ट्वेल्व थर्टी आप चढ़ जाता है धूप सीखना है सिगरेट भी फूकना है देन यू सी वॉसिट दो बजे ऑफिस शुरू होना है यू कम बैक एट टू थर्टी फिर वही ड्रामा शुरू हो जाता है कोई बुला लेगा वहाँ जाके बोलेगा साहब हमने मिनिस्ट्री में भेजा हुआ है ये वो सो एवरी टाइम आज पूछे कि मिनिस्ट्री में भेजा हुआ है फाइल क्या हुआ सर वो तो चेक करना पड़ेगा पॉइंट इज इन द लास्ट वन मंथ आपने चेक किया ही नहीं मैं पूछता रहता हूँ वो चेक कर रहा हूँ एट एट फोर ओ क्लॉक जिससे कि मेरा जाने का टाइम है मेट्रो पकड़ना है ऐसे नॉट एक्सेप्टेबल फॉर्चुनेटली द बायोमेट्रिक सिस्टम स्टार्टेड कमिंग इन देन आई सेड इफ यू डोंट कम अर्ली एंड वॉन्ट टू लीव अर्ली यू के मार्क एबसेंट यू रेस्पेक्टिव ऑफ दर थम इम्प्रेशन देर एंड टाइमिंग्स ऑफ दी ब्रेक्स एंड लंच ब्रेक आई सेट स्टिक टू इट दैट्स नॉट नॉट दिस थिंग एंड ऑफकोर्स और इम्पॉर्टेंटली वॉट आई टोल्ड एम वॉल्स तुम ये सब करके घर जाओगे शाम को अपने बेटे को बोलेगा भाई पढ़ाई करो ऐसे यू डोंट हैव द मॉरल राइट टू स्कोल योर छाइल्ड अगर काम चोरी तो तुमने दिन भर में किया है तो अपने बेटे को क्या समझेगा फिर ऐसे देर फॉर दिट्स वे आई टॉक्ट अबाउट सेल्फ स्टील देर फॉर हैव दैट सेल्फ प्राइड इन यू टू डू द मिनिमम The least you can do is earn your pay for the day as a government servant, and then probably you have earned the right to scold your child for not doing his homework. Not otherwise. I said, "Isko kya karna?" And I think this point hit them because this is what they told me later. Epilogue, I'll tell you later. Now, after this. we started working and let me tell you this uh, london works department 
had a bad reputation of surrendering funds every year, despite getting 5,000 crores annually. We are surrendering over 40% of our outlay because the gestation period of all the files are very long. After you are not changing the files. So you could utilize the funds. My first year of office, we touched 85%. My second and the last year there, we touched 94%. And same people, same office. What was the change? The approach. The approach to your work. It has to come from within. So you have to develop the passion, the commitment towards your work and your job. That is when you can, you can make a difference in your environment. Because if you lead by example, your people will actually follow you. If the boss comes late in the office, everyone else also will come late in the office. If you leave early, they will also leave early. You try this out. I am sure you have already tried this out. So keep these words, what I am telling you. Now, <clears throat> One management mantra which I have always followed as an individual. Where is the control? Volume thoda kam karna hai, chung chung ka wala. mantra which I call it my own mantra because I have not learnt it in any uh, school of you know, teaching, not in the Indian Institute of Public Administration, nor in any of the institute I have attended. I call it the percentage formula. Meaning when I am serving in a in an environment and if I am a boss of a domain I assess my subordinates, okay, and I mentally scale them into percentages. Ye x, jo hai, ye bahut badiya kaam karta hai, ye 100 percent kaam karta hai. Y, 90 percent. Z, 80 percent, so on. So you categorize people into various scales of percentages. Why so? Because what happens is, as a human being, we all expect 100% from everyone. But, invariably, it will never happen. So therefore, you remain unhappy with your subordinates because you deliver the Nira 100%. Now, because you are unhappy with him, he is unhappy with you because you are unhappy with him. So, you have a very, very, you know, uh, unwanted environment, undesirable environment. So I created this percentage formula where I have rated or scaled my subordinates at various levels and aspect when I task Y, whom I have scaled at 70%, I expect he is 70% data. And at the end of the day, he gives me 70%. I give him a shabashi, I give him a pat on the back because this 70% is his 100%. Because I have, I have judged him, yes, certain person will have. So, moment he gives me 70 percent, I give him a pat on that. Very well done, yeah. I can go over a chakra. Whereas I also want 30 percent, they get a But his capability is 70 percent. Now, this guy, who's probably never got a shabashi in his life because he could never deliver, he feels elated. He a boss me when he was shabashi. So, his self esteem gets boosted. Next time round, he works so hard that he'll probably give you 80 percent beyond his capacity. So what has happened? By giving a pat for the 70 percent, he has given you 5 percent more. So his productivity has increased. Now if you do the same with the others, you can imagine 5 percent here and 5 percent there, everybody improves. So the entire team improves. But the best outcome is what? He is happy because he got a pat on the back. I am happy because he has given me what I wanted. 
So there is a happy environment, happy team. And a happy team is a very, very productive team. And I realized, and I can watch for it, that this formula worked very well for me everywhere that I commanded. And everybody delivered more than their capacity. I may have gone wrong in about 5% of the cases where I underestimated or overestimated an individual. But by and large, this scaling, when you observe and work with people, you can't go very wrong. Try this out. You will be a happier boss. You yourself will be a happier subordinate. Okay? Probably you will have a happier environment to work in. In spite of that, there are times you come across bosses who are a pain you know where. But you have to, that is also a learning process. To be able to survive under a boss like that, that also is an art. That is also part of your profession. To be able to handle all kinds of bosses. Similarly, you handle all kinds of subordinates. You handle all kinds of your peers and colleagues. So, human resource management is about the personal interaction. Heart to heart. Like Swami Vivekananda had said, if you have read about this, that if ever there is a conflict between your head and heart, go with your heart. You never go wrong. And this is something I follow. I follow to the T. And it worked very well for me. Because I think each one of us, even if he's a peon in the office, he's a sweeper in the office, or he's a clerk in the office, we are all human beings. We can see through another individual. Degree of identifying may vary, but we all can read people. You and I know when we are interacting with each other, we make a sound. So when you work from your heart, it will come across. And it will touch the other's heart. And that is how the response will become better. So I've given you the choice. Okay, of head and heart. And keep the heart, when I talk about this, to the office and government. Okay. Now I think after having shared this formula mantra with you. I hope some of you will try and apply this. Maybe you'll find it useful. I think uh, that will be good for the day, enough for the day. Hmm? I don't know how much I have uh, taken time. But these are the points I had noted down on this piece of paper, which I thought I'd share with you. Beyond this, if you have any query, you want to know anything from me, you are most welcome to ask me now. I will try and answer. I interviewed you guys, you can interview me now. <laughs> yeah, so good officers. Huh? You don't have doubts. <laughs> oh, there's somebody who is raised. Yeah, please. Sir, I want to relate. Up to relate between defense and civil services. Like in defense, when we any subordinate makes a mistake, we punish them. And our seniors used to tell that after every punishment, you must make the person realize what was his mistake. Otherwise, you are creating a rebel in the service. But in case of civil services, we do not just punish the subordinates. And still, we have to make them. And still, it is important that they should realize what the mistake was so that you know we are not creating a rebel in the service we are creating a motivating uh, subordinate or person in the service so how can we do that in civil services in defense we have a simple fund but it's breaking here all right see uh, in the defense department you have a different environment uniform people have a different and we have an army act which guides us. And uh, so, our, you know, dispensing justice is very quick. A court martial will happen in one week's time. 
and uh, you'll really find, you'd have heard about lots of these uh, scandals where a 4G guy was also involved, poor thing was involved just because he got a bottle of scotch from the contractor. While people who have actually embezzled crores and lakhs of lakhs of crores of money gets away scot-free. This guy who just took a bottle of uh, scotch gets court washing and gets cashiered from service. Cashiered means uh, it's a very ignominious way of you know, being chucked out with no pension, no forging benefits. It's a disgraceful exit from service. We do that. And if he does a little bigger crime, he'll go to the jail also. However, when it comes to your civil services, again, we have certain guidelines which have been laid down. I've gone to this commission also. We have had a few issues. What I can tell you is that if somebody has made a mistake, it should not be overlooked. Many a time, we feel that we do to do This attitude is where the problem starts. So, there are ways and means of dealing with the problem. If somebody makes a mistake, you try and guide him. He repeats the same mistake, that then you counsel him to man up. Third time, you tell him, okay, if you this thing are then I'll then I will see ya. I mark you accordingly in your CR. So you have given him three level of counseling, you know, in, in, a, in a different manner. And if it continues to be a income pool, you grade him accordingly as a income pool. Then when the time for grading comes, he said, Good morning, sir. You can much of it. Sir Didi Pache, sir. Then you say, Acha, uh, I was telling to Devi Sakta, very good. So five very good, she qualified for the next slide. You know? But if all of you have marked you as poor three times, you will make it to the next. Now as he grows, his area of influence increases. Remember that also. So you are giving somebody, an incompetent guy, to grow in service by ignoring his mistakes. And if you punish a guy for a genuine mistake, I'm sure no one will rebel. In fact, if you have given him enough chances, he will be grateful for the punishment that you have given, which is probably way below you should have, uh, uh, the uh, uh, about amount you should have got actually. So, punishing an individual for a mistake that he or she has committed, if you have to do, you have to do. I don't think you should compromise on this. That is where we talk about the work environment. This will impact the others. I'll share with you. Uh, I was a major sub, Sikkim High Institute. There's a JCO, Junior Commissioned Officer. JCO. He's come from the banks. He becomes a Sumedha. Okay. <coughs> Some inspector, right? He had some issues. DP ka issue tha, gussa ho jodhya. Now he got into fight with almost everyone. One day he fought with the adjutant, a captain or a young major. And uh, that time I happened to be the second in command. And so I tried to counsel him. So he picked up a fight with me. And I realized, like I said, my approach uh, to my Ben was of an elder brother, always or a father, you know, the two were very young. So I actually used to take pains in man managing my soldier. So when the JCO picked up a fight with me, I called him to my office and I told him that uh, I think it's time for you to leave the forge. He said, how can I leave the forge? I said, no, I'll let you leave the forge because you don't deserve to be in uniform now. You have served enough. So, you seek your premature retirement or I'll have you caught washing for disobedience of orders. 
He disobeyed me. I'll not get into the details. He had to quit. He took premature retirement because he didn't want to face the court martial. One week's time, he left. He back in Nepal. After that, my own soldiers and jawans and the Subhidat Major, who is the senior most rank among the rank now, other ranks. He came and told me that Sahib, you have done a lot of work. This man has eaten our heads. Which I didn't know. So, while there is a time in the night, I thought that I have eaten my milk. But I said, in the good of the organization, for the good of the organization, I said, I must do what needs to be done. Sent him home. And what is the fallout? Very positive. And it will happen in an environment also. You punish a guy who is a badmash, others will not feel happy. Does that answer your question? No. Yeah, but the Anything is specific. You see, uh, it's very difficult for me to give you a guideline to Esa Karna. Follow your hearts. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Okay. Pleasure uh, interacting with you all. And uh, such a pleasure to such bright, like I said in the beginning, smiling faces. And uh, I feel very confident about the future of Arunachal, which you guys have, uh, to hold the administrative aspects of its state. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you.